Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, when I think of the uh, visits I've made to Scotland uh, in the course of my career, inevitably I think of the many Scottish colleagues that I've, I've worked with. Um, Jim Wallace, uh, former Deputy First Minister, uh, gave me my first role in, in my party as the party's economics advisor. Uh, I've worked very closely with Nicholas Stephen, who did so much to promote renewables in Scotland when he was the energy minister here. Or, of course, Alistair Carmichael and John Thurso, uh, whose constituencies I've been visiting, and they've been explaining to me the many strengths of the energy opportunity here in Scotland, and, of course, particularly in their constituencies. Um, but as Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, I have even more compelling reasons to be here. With its superb natural and human resource, Scotland is the centre of our plans for a thriving, low-carbon economy. This country is home to a significant proportion of Britain's wind, wave and tidal energy, and almost all the hydropower. Scotland has innovative uh, companies and entrepreneurs. It has universities that specialise in energy research, and now Edinburgh hosts the UK's Green Investment Bank, due to be launched very soon. So much of the work we do to attract investors to Britain's energy markets directly benefits Scottish businesses and Scottish communities. So it's really appropriate, I think, that I'm here to talk to you about the opportunities for low carbon investment. Over the next decade, the UK energy sector is going to change radically. As more and more renewables and low carbon energy come online, and significant infrastructure investments are made. The UK's investment need is extremely strong. As ageing infrastructure is shut down, as demand rises, and as we meet our emissions and renewable targets, we need to double the current rate of investment in energy between now and 2020. So there are huge opportunities for new investors. Existing players' balance sheets alone will not deliver the investment at that scale. And when it comes to energy industries, the UK is already highly rated as an attractive location for investment. So the opportunities for British businesses, if we play this right, are very significant. From offshore wind to marine and tidal, we can turn promising beginnings into genuinely world-leading industries with supply chains to match. So my pr uh, priority is to provide certainty, to reassure investors and entrepreneurs alike that the UK is and will remain a fantastic place to do low carbon business. And if you look at what we've done so far and the work that's still underway, I think you can see that priority clearly. We are opening up markets, giving investors confidence for the long term and removing barriers to entry. Take the reforms of the electricity market in the Energy Bill, which are designed to unlock some £110 billion of investment in electricity infrastructure. We want to encourage competition on cost between low-carbon electricity sources. So our strategy is to set up a framework that will offer reliable contracts delivered in ways that are trusted by investors. We have chosen the feed-in tariff with contracts for difference, providing a guaranteed price to deliver clear and predictable revenue streams, bringing down the cost of capital. I've spoken to global fund managers who say that the uncertainty of the current arrangement has actually put them off investing in the UK, but that contracts for difference give them the predictable revenue streams in the way they recognise so they can invest in the big projects. And in case you're not aware, let me explain how they work, which is, uh, some would say is a brave task, but let me do it. It's very simple, actually. We set a fair price for low-carbon electricity, the strike price. The generator sells its electricity in the market and is paid a variable premium to top up to the strike price if necessary. And if the market price is higher than the strike price, the generator pays back the difference. And the key thing here, the central insight, is certainty. Contracts for difference can help smooth out market volatility, minimising costs to the consumer, whilst also making investment and financing decisions much easier. 
And because energy still needs to be sold in the market, there are still powerful incentives to encourage energy efficiency. So the reforms in the Energy Bill are specifically designed to move us away from past and current systems of intervention to blaze a trail towards competition. That is the ultimate aim of our reform of the electricity market. Yet we have to be realistic on the path to a low carbon electricity market. I'd love to see low carbon power sources competing on cost alone as soon as possible. But we can't just flick a switch and make that happen instantly. So our reforms are phased. The first few years of contracts for difference will see prices set administratively in a similar way to how rock bands are set now. Then, as different technologies mature and start becoming more cost competitive, we'll see the first technology-specific auctions, perhaps as early as 2017. And when all technologies have matured, we'll move to technology-neutral auctions. Finally, when all technologies are mature enough and the carbon price is high enough and sustainable enough, all generators will compete without any intervention. And this move, gradual move, from price setting to price discovery will be complete with low carbon electricity sources competing on cost to provide clean, affordable, secure energy for UK consumers. Now I've heard in talking to investors, uh, not just here at this conference, but over recent months, that we, you want us to get on with it. Uh, as Senor Galan might say, vamos. Uh, and that's what we are going uh, to do. And I think in the next few weeks, uh, some of the questions that remain outstanding, and there aren't that many of them actually, they will be answered. So the reforms in the Energy Bill are about building a framework for a new competitive electricity market, unlocking a huge amount of investment and changing the way we generate electricity. We also, on that pathway, want to change the way we save energy demand-side response and additional storage and interconnection will play an increasingly important role in managing supply. And these ideas will be promoted by policies within and without the bill. And our, mo our most far-reaching change on energy efficiency is, of course, our plans to create a new market to bring substantial energy savings within the reach of millions. The Green Deal. This is our flagship energy efficiency pro uh, pro program. It will enable homes and businesses to pay for energy efficiency improvements through savings on their fuel bills. A successful, effective Green Deal will save money, save carbon, and make a real contribution to economic growth, supporting new jobs and new businesses and un unlocking unprecedented choice for consumers. And it's a program that won't just run for years, but it will run for decades because it's a new market. People will get warmer homes for less, and businesses will get the chance to be part of new installation and supply chains stretching right across the country. We want to establish a vibrant new market in energy efficiency, one that could attract over £10 billion of investment in new energy efficiency in the residential and business sectors over the next decade. Then take our work to bring on renewables. It's not just about hitting our legally binding targets. It's also about reducing our energy imports and insulating our country from spikes in global energy markets. A greater role for, for sustainable energy sources within our diverse energy mix can protect Britain from fossil fuel price shocks. And it can also bring significant growth to our economy. Last week, I was at the launch of Norstech, a new industry-led network focused on realizing the potential for offshore renewables in the northern seas. Some of you may have been there too. Certainly, I hope many more of you uh, will come to these future events as this important network continues to grow and influence. Norstech sets out a vivid and compelling vision of the opportunities this sector can bring, the jobs and investment it can generate. And I make clear, as the Prime Minister also has, that this is a vision that we support fully. We are focused not just on growth, but on a more balanced form of growth, with decisions taken 
for the long term. Our commitment to a low carbon future is driven by a hard headed assessment that this is good for our economy and essential for our long term energy security. That is why we want more renewables in our energy mix and why, over the past two years, we've added more renewable capacity than at any time in the last decade. That's a good start, but we have a long way to go. If we're to get to 15% of our total energy from renewables, we're going to need closer to 30% of our electricity to be renewable. That is a significant challenge in itself. But we also need these crucial new technologies to deliver in a cost-effective way. The cost of support for renewables isn't actually huge. At the moment, it's around three pence out of every pound on the average household electricity bill. But it is a cost, and it's there. So we have a responsibility to our citizens to create a low-carbon energy mix that's affordable for the taxpayer, the bill payer, and the whole wider economy. Now, we expect the cost of generating electricity offshore to fall, and we are working closely with industry to deliver further savings. There's a historical precedent. Our oil and gas supply chain benefited from direct and indirect government support, building a world-class industry. As Lord Brown argued in a report for the Royal Academy of Engineering, we can and should do the same for offshore wind. And as the Cost Reduction Task Force showed, if we work together, cost-competitive offshore wind could be less than a decade away. Right across the supply chain, from research and design to operations and maintenance, I want all of our renewable industries to be ready and able to hold their own on the world stage. Scotland is already at the forefront of the UK renewables industry. And I'm keen in particular to harness the tremendous wind and wave resources in the Scottish islands. I've been impressed with the wind, wave and tidal developments I've seen on Shet Shetland and Orkneys this week. I welcome the role that the islands want to play in meeting our renewables targets. But I also recognise the concerns they express about the speed of progress with their projects. So I'm pleased to announce, in conjunction with the Scottish Government, an independent study on Scottish island renewable generation driven by a new steering group. This study will assess the commercial viability of renewable projects on the Scottish islands and consider any barriers to their development. I want all interested parties to have a chance to engage with this study and I want progress to be quick. Carbon capture and storage is another technology we want to see in our low carbon energy mix and another sector where Scotland has significant expertise. So I'm pleased also to announce a £20 million investment through the Energy Technologies Institute to develop next generation CCS technology for gas power stations, investment which is part of the government's four year £125 million R&D programme to develop cheaper, better CCS technologies. This project will see a new 5 megawatt CCS demonstration plant constructed, the core of which will use Scottish manufactured components and will be capable of capturing up to 95% of CO2 emissions. Immediately after this conference, I'm heading down the road to Renfrew to see for myself the work being done by the two Scottish-based companies involved in this project. One is Howden, a 150-year-old company which worked on London's iconic Battersea Power Station back in the 1930s. It has now shown decades of Scottish innovation, has already exported $10 million worth of CCS components, and is still creating jobs and actively hiring engineers. The other is Doosan Power Systems, a global company which has chosen Scotland as the base for its CCS Centre of Excellence. CCS provides an excellent opportunity for British manufacturing and I'm delighted to see Scottish companies in the vanguard, creating jobs for skilled workers and growth for the economy. And I'm determined that the UK will retain its reputation as one of the best places in the world to invest in energy. So we're also working to break through some of the non-financial barriers holding up investment, for example, through planning reform. 
the national policy statements on energy will make our planning system faster, more predictable, and more accountable. To overcome non-financial barriers to deployment of renewables, we've also got the Renewable Energy Roadmap, which focuses on the eight key technologies which have the greatest potential. And we're determined to see a more liquid and competitive power market. So we are working with industry and Ofgem to ensure all investors can manage risks and have fair routes to market. Now, as we drive forward low carbon investment, I'm keen that we don't lose sight of the critical interaction that most people outside the industry have with their energy industry. That's their electricity and gas bill. Here in Scotland, I know that consumers have faced rising bills, and I'm more convinced than ever that collective purchasing and collective switching can play a big role in helping Scottish households get a better deal for their gas and electricity. That is why I'm issuing a challenge to local authorities and third sector organisations to come up with new collective purchasing initiatives, and why the government is putting £5 million into funding across Great Britain to help these local authorities and third sector organisations to get off the ground. And I'm particularly keen to see these schemes focused on using collective purchasing to help the most vulnerable households, the fuel poor. Now, it would not be possible to speak here in Edinburgh about the energy industry without at least noting the independence debate that is unfolding. It won't surprise you to hear that I believe Scotland is stronger as part of the UK and the UK is stronger from having Scotland within it. And I believe renewables are a case in point. Scotland's superb natural resources and growing expertise holds massive potential, helping the UK to deliver our target of 15% of energy by 2020. And the economics of renewables means that Scotland benefits from integration with the UK consumer base providing certainty and security to underpin the full commercial potential of renewables here. In an increasingly interdependent world, I believe it's an inescapable fact that we are best able to make the progress we want on energy security and on climate change by remaining not only in a single energy market, but within a single economy. I believe that stable constitutional settlement and consistent economic framework contributes significantly to investor confidence. Facing so many collective challenges, we must share our strengths and pull risks where we can. And I believe that it is by working together as proud nations within the United Kingdom, and without creating a new international boundary between us, that we can most effectively realize our shared objectives. Now, I mentioned the UK Green Investment Bank earlier. Alongside a reform to the electricity market and a step change on energy efficiency through the Green Deal, the UK Green Investment Bank heralds the beginning of a new industrial policy as it opens for business and starts making its first investments. As with the government's other energy and climate change policies, the UK Green Investment Bank is about looking to a different horizon, not just thinking short term, but building a more sustainable economy. The bank is genuinely a world first, and I know that capitals around the world will be looking to this great capital city, monitoring the bank's progress. Without wishing to labour the point, it's also a perfect example of the strengths of the UK, why Scotland and its partners in the UK are better off together. People in England, Wales and Northern Ireland will benefit from the significant expertise that Scotland's financial and green energy communities, working closely with colleagues in London, can bring to the UK Green Investment Bank. And the decision to base the bank in Edinburgh, a bank capitalised with £3 billion of UK government money, thanks to the strength and the depth of the UK fiscal base, means there is real potential for the development of green energy and finance clusters in Edinburgh and the rest of Scotland to the benefit of us all. The UK's energy future will be a low-carbon energy future. My job as Secretary of State is to make that happen sooner rather than later and ensure that investors in the UK and British-based firms and employees then reap the gains here and across the world 
I know you want to play your part in that. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Wherever you prefer. Big question. Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know where this is working, but uh, thank you very much indeed, Secretary of State, for that invigorating uh, address, and, and certainly I feel quite a bit more cheerful as a result of it. Uh, well, now's your chance. I think we've got about um, 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes for a few questions for the Secretary of State. I'm, I'm being told five minutes. Um, first, uh, one or two questions for the Secretary of State. So now's your chance, really, to, you, you've got a, a key policymaker in front of you to, to ask those questions you, you've been burning to ask. So can I um, see the first hand for a question? Oh, there we are. Um, sorry, question in the, in the middle there. I think it's, it's Max by the look of it. Yeah, uh, Max Carcass, Kyle Luleman, EMIC. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the figure of three pence on a consumer bill. Um, and I just wonder if, if you feel the public are really aware of that figure and indeed whether that's the right number for what we're trying to do in terms of the change in in energy. Uh, is that a, enough of an insurance premium against all the uncertainties and to back renewables? Um, have we taken enough risk to date, I guess, is, is, is the question. And have, how do we get that support from, from consumers and, and kind of a commitment to, um, to supporting renewables? Well, I'm absolutely sure that many people don't realise uh, that this fantastic renewables industry is coming at such a low cost to the consumer. Uh, and I certainly see it as my role to try to uh, change that and to put the case that this is actually very good value for money, uh, not least because it doesn't just secure a decarbonised energy sector, but it's so good for energy security, uh, long-term energy security. And I think when people do hear that argument, they, are, they, they can be swayed. Um, and it is surprising uh, sometimes uh, people don't seem to have the same facts that uh, uh, the uh, independent analysts have. Uh, if anyone reading some papers might think that high energy bills are simply down to government policy, when of course we all know that it's the big increases in oil and gas prices that have seen the rises in energy bills uh, that, that are so difficult for for households and businesses, and actually the impact on renew of renewables investment is tiny compared to that. Um, moreover, that the, the money that's being spent uh, by consumers, if you like, on renewables is on jobs and energy future in this country, uh, rather than paying for gas being uh, imported from other parts of the world. So I think this is a, the case for this investment is extremely strong. Um, it is true to say, and we need to be frank and honest, that the cost of the support for renewables over the next decade is going to grow from that three pence that I, uh, that I referred to. If we're going to see the massive increase in offshore wind that, uh, that I believe we will see, if we're going to see uh, the investment in uh, wave and tidal power that we're going to see, of course that's got to be paid for. The investment in CCS will have to be uh, paid for. But the numbers will still be extremely small, uh, and the benefits will still be absolutely huge. So uh, you know, I hope we can all actually, don't just leave it to me, <laughs> I think we can all engage in that debate and make sure we have a rather more balanced debate than sometimes we see in some newspapers. Great. Um, second question, um, just down here. Thank you. Uh, Neil Stewart from Scottish Renewables. Uh, Secretary of State, can I welcome your recognition of the challenges to renewable electricity developments on the islands through the, the setting up of the working group? Um, and I know it's, uh, it, it's not even met yet, but I'm going to ask you about what the conclusions <laughs> might be. Um, I, th I don't see a situation other than that group recommending that uh, the Department for Energy and Climate Change is going to have to intervene and uh, either introduce a supplement to renewables obligation or contract for difference for developments on the islands 
to meet those higher transmission charges, or that you, the Secretary of State, are going to have to use the powers under Section 185 to actually cap transmission charges uh, to the islands. I, I don't see uh, Transmit uh, bringing forward a, a solution that's going to bring transmission charges down to economic levels. And the question is, and I'm guessing it's a difficult one to answer, do you have a sense which the Department would favour uh, an additional supplement to the ROC or some kind of cap on transmission charges? The temptations you put in front of me. Um, I should say uh, that I'm delighted that we're getting a set up this joint working group and then uh, that will then commission this independent study. Uh, my department will take all the advice of the working group to do that. And it actually shows the strength of, of the working relationship, I think, between the UK government and the Scottish government. I met with the First Minister and Fergus Hewan this morning uh, and uh, they've been very instrumental in, in making this happen. Uh, and uh, it's that collaboration that I think uh, underpins the announcement today. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to speculate on the outcome. Uh, thank you for that temptation. Um, but I, I should say, first of all, that Ofgem have done a huge amount of work after Project Transmit. Project Transmit helped for renewable development on the mainland, but it left this question uh, of the islands. And there is a working group, as you know, where Ofgem is playing a very important role to try to see if there are ways through and the working group and the study that, that I've announced today are not intended to cut across that work. It's to work with the work that Ofgem's been doing uh, to see if we can find a way forward. Uh, and in looking at that work uh, to date and talking to the industry, to EMEC and to others in my trip to Shetland and Orkneys uh, this week, um, I can see the huge potential, the massive potential and we need to find some sort of way through here. I don't know what that, that is, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Um, it's got to be a solution, however, that both realises the potential, but understands that consumers still have to pay. There is always this balance. Uh, we want clean energy, but we also want affordable and secure energy. Uh, so we always are having to bring that balance to these sorts of issues. Um, but I hope the way forward that I've announced, which will be a quick way, it's not gonna, this is not long grass stuff, this is trying to get a decision as soon as uh, is possible, a credible, robust, uh, evidence-based for taking that decision. Uh, I hope that will reassure many people. Uh, right, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. I see a hand um, just in the middle there. Thank you. John, John Cape from iPower. We're a social enterprise working with low-income communities. I was delighted to see the support and encouragement you were giving for uh, collective purchasing, collective switching, and so on. Uh, it is still the case um, that far fewer people than would benefit have switched their energy supply, and many uh, are paying over the odds as a consequence. It's still far more difficult for many people to switch uh, their energy uh, account than it is, for example, to switch their mobile phone account. Are there ways in which you can, work in with Ofgem, encourage it to be as simple to switch your energy account and as hassle-free as it is for people to switch their mobile phone account? I'm really glad you've asked that question because I'm passionate about renewables, but I'm also passionate about tackling fuel poverty. And uh, when I was the Department of Business uh, as a Consumer Affairs Minister, it did seem to me that collective purchase generally was something we could do to help more vulnerable people who have difficulty accessing markets, but actually that it applied particularly to energy. Um, energy is a homogenous product. Uh, we might like to buy more green energy, but generally energy is a homogenous uh, product and therefore it can lend itself uh, to uh, bringing people together so they can purchase it together. And we've seen switching rates broadly come down despite uh, increases in energy prices. And that's partly because a uh, few of the energy companies are doing doorstep selling. Uh, and I think many of us welcome that, actually, some of the experiences. But we do need to make sure that the switching is playing that role, both to drive competition in retail markets, but also working more for the more vulnerable customers. And uh, some of the analysis I've seen suggests that those who switch nowadays tend to be the more internet savvy, uh, and then probably, the, therefore, they're the more well healed. Uh, and, and therefore, I think it's important if, when, as we design uh, collective purchase schemes, collective switching schemes, that we make sure that the fuel poor are there right at the center. So in the competition, the five million pound competition that we've uh, set out, 
where we're wanting many local authorities and community groups to benefit from them, that we'll, we will be uh, looking at schemes that have the fuel poor built in and how they can be brought into collective switching schemes. I think this is a real powerful opportunity. We have to work with the industry. I find the industry incredibly helpful, uh, to be honest. I've, uh, you know, people complain about the big six, but actually I've engaged with them and they're worried about consumer bills as well, actually, let's be clear. And uh, Deputy Prime Minister announced a deal in April. Uh, it was a voluntary deal and the, the big six are, are ensuring that um, their customers are told every year of the best available tariff for them, which is, uh, you know, is going to help stimulate uh, switching. Uh, I think the collective switching I've talked about will stimulate switching. I also think the work that Ofgem is doing in the retail market review, we've yet to hear the final conclusions of that, that will help. But, but a key part of that will be simpler bills so people get the information. And we can use uh, a whole range of new ways of getting information to people so it's easier for them to switch. So uh, that's absolutely a uh, core of what, what I want to do for electricity and gas consumers, and I think it will help the uh, electricity market. It was interesting when which ran their big switch, uh, when we saw 37,000 households switch, saving an average of over £230 a year, that actually it was a new supplier who came in, not with a hugely lower price, but they still won uh, business, and that helped move the market. And I think uh, that that is a good thing. That won't always happen. But I think uh, by helping people reap the best from the deals that are already there, that they don't seem to be taking uh, benefit on, uh, ways, thinking of new ways to do that is really important for our citizens. Well, I think, um, uh, we, unfortunately, we're going to have to say thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of the day to the Secretary of State. So thank you uh, again for your upbeat comments and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your visit to Scotland. Well, thank you very much. Have an enjoyable conference.